Video games are unusual products that differ from other industrial goods in which electrical power, machines and creative work are integrated. They are an aggregation of a variety of academic disciplines including engineering, literature, the arts and psychology and can be considered a cultural tool for the fun required by society. The game arcades in the late 1970s were the places for boys to play rather rough kill the alien type of games, so I wanted to turn it into a brighter and more fun place where women and couples could feel comfortable going. That was Toru Iwatani, the creator of one of video games, no scrub that, all of media's most recognisable characters, Pac-Man. Yeah, it's believed that 94% of Americans recognise what this 300 degree circle is and that makes him more recognisable than both Sonic, Mario and, well, no, he's still got a few more pellets to chomp before he can take on Mickey Mouse. Regardless, that's not a bad statistic, is it? Just think, the entire world of video games are literally beneath this guy. Sure, in more recent years, youngsters will argue whatever crazed obsession they're into will be more popular than Pac-Man, but when that's all over, it always comes back to Pac-Man. Without a doubt, one of the most recognisable shapes in all of video game history. 111 tiny little pixels make up his most iconic shape as it drops you in the middle of a neon blue bordered maze as you take on 244 pellets, running away from the ghost, chasing the ghost and doing this repeatedly until you move on to the next stage. And of course, don't forget the fruit. Nothing needs to be explained when it comes to Pac-Man, its simplicity at its most basic form, yet it's pushed the boundaries of what was expected from arcades at the time, and because of that, it captured the imaginations and wallets of everybody who saw it, no matter your age or your sex, and has even to this day continued to stand as the absolute king of all of gaming. But... Let's not get ahead of ourselves guys, let's go back to the beginning and take a look at the gargantuan world that is Pac-Man, where we will be looking into and confirming his origins, his tremendous legacy, his merchandise and of course, his games. Welcome to Slope's Game Room. The year is 1955 and the Nakamura Manufacturing Company, which would eventually be renamed to simply Namco, had just started its long journey down the road of becoming an established entertainment empire after installing a couple of rocking horses on the roof of a Japanese shopping center. The company was started by Masaya Nakayama, with the equivalent of only $3,000 to his name. And those rocking horses were just a couple of old second-hand units that Nakamura-san would personally operate alone, welcoming guests, repairing them, polishing and cleaning them on a daily basis. And before long, Nakamura-san started to see a real driving interest in those coin-operated machines. Several already established arcade companies, as well as plenty of coin-op amusement companies, were fully taking over the Japanese market. Nakamura-san was obviously experiencing this ever-growing craze unfold right in front of him and as he built relationships with several shopping centers and other dedicated family getaways, he started to lease several arcade machines from these companies to put into these establishments. This eventually led to the creation of their own coin-operated Elemeca machine, including the stupidly impressive 1970s machine racer, or F1 as it would eventually be rebranded branded to, but the real interesting part of the company's history piece came a little bit later on in the 70s. You see, one of the newer arcade manufacturers to enter the Japanese arcade space was a little known company known as Atari. Now obviously Atari was very well known on western shores with the co-founder Nolan Bushnell pushing it out to everybody he could and Japan was next, with a little help from Namco. But it turns out that this was harder than expected. We had real problems in Japan. 
Japan is a pretty closed market, difficult to get your product in, closed distribution. That's why we did the deal with Nakamura and Namco. He was willing to sort of break with tradition and start working with an American company. And he really made money on Breakout. And make money he did, but not in the way you would expect. Breakout was indeed the latest and greatest Atari arcade unit, but due to Nolan Bushnell only sending over supposedly 15 units, it wasn't exactly doing all that well even though everybody that played it seemed to love it. So what was the problem? Why did Nolan Bushnell send so few units? Well, that would be the Yakuza. Yes, you heard that right, the Yakuza, aka the Japanese Mafia. It turns out unlike other gangs or criminal organizations around the world, this Japanese posse were incredibly versatile and highly intelligent, to the point where they had done quite well for themselves reverse engineering and then remaking the incredibly popular breakout machines for themselves with incredible speed and efficiency. Whereas Atari and Namco's collaboration was very, very slow, creating the machines and shipping them over took time, and Atari was not willing to let Namco make these machines for themselves, whereas the Yakuza saw no problem in doing that exactly exact thing. This led to Nakamura-san getting caught out sending his men in to investigate and eventually meeting up with the head of the Yakuza himself and simply asking them to stop what they're doing. But of course, a deal was thrown back in his face to work together to take hold of the entire Japanese arcade industry, which they no doubt would have accomplished if Nakamura-san accepted the offer. However, he rightfully refused as there was simply no way that this would end well for anyone besides the Japanese Mafia leaders, and with this, he went about his way to tackle the issue himself. Tensions were already pretty high between both Atari and Namco by this point, and now Namco had to deal with this. They had to take on the Yakuza. And the way they did that very thing was to beat them at their own game by outselling them. He quickly went to London to meet with an incredibly hungover Nolan Bushnell to explain this predicament and to get as many machines shipped over as possible. But after Bushy's mad night of drinking, he wasn't exactly in the freshest state, and the short meeting at the bar, according to Nakamura-san, was a complete waste of time. Now, just to add a little disclaimer here guys, Nolan Bushnell actually denies that these meetings ever took place. He doesn't understand why Breakout was selling so badly in Japan and he doesn't remember anybody ever asking him for more units, so believe who you want to believe. Regardless of who you do believe, the counterfeit machines did in fact happen, and to combat this without the help of Atari, what Namco did next would change the course of the company from here on out. They decided to create the machines themselves without the authorization from Atari, just like the Japanese Mafia did, in an attempt to outsell the Japanese Mafia. So yeah, as Nolan Bushnell already stated, they made a lot of money doing this exact thing. This, among other fights between the two giants, would eventually lead to the odd lawsuit here and there, which isn't what this video is about. This video is about Namco's early days in the arcade business, and even though Breakout isn't exactly the first game they ever made, because, you know, they didn't, it was actually a copy of another company's machine, it still led them down the path of creating their own arcade machines and hiring Toru Iwatani. A young, excitable 22-year-old that joined the company in 1977. He had a keen interest in graphic arts and gaming, but his main passion and the reason he joined the company was to actually make pinball machines and not arcade machines. There was just one problem. The company didn't make pinball machines. I liked pinball and I thought I had joined a company which made pinball machines, but the company didn't make pinball machines. So I was quite disappointed. But then I thought, why not make something like a combination between pinball and a video game? Now this is where that GB game comes into play that I have brought up in the past, and my opinion on that game hasn't exactly changed since then. You know the game Pong, right? You know the game Breakout, right? Well, this is essentially that, with a touch of pinball. A small white dot bounces around the screen, taking out small lines with every hit, and your job is to remove them all. 
It again isn't really all that different to break out apart from the random bumpers found in the middle of the playing field just like a pinball machine. And as, well, okay as the game was, it was literally just that. It was just okay. And although it did eventually spawn a few spin-offs and sequels which are available via the Namco Museum collection on the PlayStation, its biggest problem was that ball and paddle arcade games were so incredibly common in the arcade space, making this game merely a drop of knockoff cola in whatever sweaty arcade that it found itself in. Which was actually, sadly, almost none of them, and because of that, it has become an incredibly rare cabinet to ever find in the wild. In fact, games like this were coming out left, right and centre, so much so that arcade goers were obviously getting quite bored of them. However, in 1978, a brand new arcade game hit the market and it blew everything out of the water and nope, I'm not talking about Pac-Man. Taito were the guys behind this one and that game was none other than Space Invaders. Yep, Space Invaders, another game that is one of the most iconic arcade games ever made. A game that you play as an actual game character, I suppose, against three different types of easily identifiable pixelated aliens and a UFO, to an ever-increasing heartbeat-type soundtrack that quite literally captivated players and still does to this very day. The game became so incredibly popular that some arcades would literally have nothing but this one game several times over. And when it was eventually released in America later that same year, a similar effect impacted all who played it there too. And just like before, crazy amounts of Space Invader inspired games heavily hit production from everyone trying to grab and hold on to that sweet alien pie. And honestly, Namco was no different. But we will cover the game Galaxian another time. It was becoming apparent that if you were clever enough to create something new and innovative for the arcades and you did it right, then that is what you needed to do. And although there were obviously some fantastic innovations during this time that did indeed try something new, the safest bet was sadly to copy instead. However, Iwatani Sun, our pinball obsessed game designer of GB, was actually one of those guys that wanted to do it differently. He was bored of constant space shooting war games, thanks to Space Invaders, that filled every arcade, bowling alley, and takeaway that he visited, and decided to look at one of the new innovations that Space Invaders brought to the table that the vast majority hadn't thought about up to this point. It's not about aliens, and it's not about the space theme, it's about you the character that you play as in the game. As basic as that may look, that little shooting rocket at the bottom of the screen wasn't just a moving target, it was a character that you needed to control in order to save the planet. This and the want to move away from warlike aggressive shooting games was indeed the seeds of something astronomically special. If he could make a game that had an easily distinguishable character, then not only would it perhaps be something new and exciting, but moving it away from the angry nature of what was popular at the time, it may even invite a female audience to the arcades, which were most definitely dominated by males at the time. Space Invaders also gave another piece of inspiration to Iwatani Sun, this time from the developer himself. Because guys, in case you didn't know, the creator and the brains behind Space Invaders actually came from a dream that the creator had one night, and apparently that went a little like this. Once upon a time, there were some kids in a school being attacked by aliens, waiting for Father Christmas to arrive as the sky filled with rows upon rows of attacking alien scumbags. The desperate children's only means of attack was a laser beam they had built from an old car battery, spark plugs and... a hubcap. Nope, didn't make that up. Iwatani Sun found this concept rather inspirational and decided to base his next game on plenty of classic anime and western cartoons that appealed to a worldwide audience such as Casper and more notably Kutaro the Ghost, the story of a chubby ghost who often found himself getting into trouble and eating way too much in the process rather than whatever the latest craze was in the arcades. 
The idea was to take kanji words from these popular loved by all no matter your sex inspirations such as Taberu, which translates to eat, to eventually come up with the premise for his new game. From this eating theme came the next kanji word, Kuchi, which was the shape of a square which ultimately became the inspiration for the character himself. And the very next piece of the Pac-Man puzzle is the one game in fact that everybody in the world thinks they know. The pizza thing. It's often believed that iwatani san went out to lunch for pizza, took one slice, looked down and saw what would eventually become the most recognisable video game character of all time. And although that is indeed true to a degree, as I just explained, it was a fair bit more complicated than simply a pizza missing a slice. Although it's fair to say that the easiest and most digestible way to market the creation of the game is to say that that was the inspiration for the game. <laughs> Get it? Digestible? <laughs> it's half true. In Japanese, the character for mouth, Kuchi, is a square shape. It's not circular like the pizza, but I decided to round it out. There was the temptation to make the Pac-Man shape less simple. While I was designing this game, someone suggested we add eyes. But we eventually discarded that idea because once we added eyes, we would want to add glasses and maybe a moustache. There would just be no end to it. Food is the other part of the basic concept. In my initial design, I had to put the player in the midst of food all over the screen. As I thought about it, I realised the player wouldn't know exactly what to do. The purpose of the game would be obscure. So I created a maze and put the food in it. Then whoever played the game would have some structure by moving through the maze. The Japanese have a slang word. Paku Paku. They used to describe the motion of the mouth opening and closing while one eats. The name Puckman came from that word. With this idea quickly growing and a small team around him, they decided to move forward with the whole Monster Gobbler idea, but in an attempt to up the Space Invader ante, they decided to change the monsters to ghosts. And cute ghosts, of course, because, you know, females. And to push the idea even further, all four ghosts would have set characteristics in the way that they chase Puckman, which meant that the power-up for our poor defenseless circle would be needed to take on these ghoulies. And this inspiration actually came from, and I love that this is a real fact, Popeye. <laughs> God, do I love Popeye. Okay, 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 okay. <laughs> Whilst all this was going on, Namco's other team, the ones working on the Space Invader Destroyer that was Galaxian, released that game in 1979, and although it wasn't the first ever colour video game, it was indeed the first at taking RGB colour graphics and creating multi-coloured sprites. Obviously not a big deal now, but if there ever was a Space Invader killer, then this was gonna be it. Iwatani Sun liked this, he liked it a lot. After all, his last game, GB, that gave the illusion of multicoloured graphics, was only able to do this by sticking stripes of coloured cellophane onto the screen. So, he decided to implement this into his new game so that the ghosts with different techniques would be easily identifiable and of course those colours would be softer pastel-like colours so that he could continue to market it towards females and couples. Over the next year, which was an incredibly long time for an arcade game to take back then, the design and recreation of the ghost continued to evolve and during this time, iwatani Sun's love for pinball grew as two new versions of his classic GB game got released called Bombi and QTQ. And it was actually here that we possibly got to see our first look at one of the earlier designs of one of the Pac-Man ghosts because in the game QTQ, you can actually see three pink ghosts at the top of the screen but slightly redesigned. Anyway. Puckman was eventually released on October 10th, 1979. A whole one year and five months of development went into the game, which again was completely unheard of back then, and the response was... Well, it was okay. Space Invaders was crazily popular still, and Namco's very own Galaxian had people queuing up to play it. Puckman, however was a very strange cabinet, often looked at by people that were waiting to play on something else. The game was taken to a building in Shibuya that no longer exists. 
It was a thin, chimney-shaped building with seven or eight floors, consisting of several movie theatres. On the top floor, there was a very long, narrow room where the couples, having just seen the movies, would go up to have a little enjoyment before they returned home, so they weren't necessarily gamers. The women and couples were very happy about the machine, very excited. They came up to it and put their hands on it, so we thought that our target concept had been very much in sync and correct. They played it and they were more or less satisfied. They figured out how to play it. It's not a difficult game. On the other hand, the core gamers, the men, were not necessarily very excited about it. But it was for people who didn't play games on a daily basis. Women, children, the elderly. It's not like people sat around and played the machine all day though, so we didn't think it would be a major hit. I didn't think that the US and Europe would take it up because it's a rather slow, relaxing game. At that time, what was popular overseas were more thrilling games, and I felt that perhaps the rhythm of Pac-Man wasn't matching the needs of overseas users. The design was very different from what you came to expect with its big, mostly white arcade cabinet, the ghosts were named Akabe, Pinky, Aosuki and Gazooka, and this was when Midway got involved. These guys licensed both Galaxian and Puckman, and just like they did with Space Invaders, they decided to westernise the whole thing. Firstly, the garish cabinet got changed from white to yellow, Puckman himself actually ended up looking even more odd, and the names of the ghosts got changed to Blinky, Pinky, Inky and Clyde. A strange move that although did help with not only the localization of the cabinet, did raise the question, why didn't they just rename them into their translated names, which were obviously Chaser, Ambusher, Fickle and Stupid, obviously given to them due to the movements that they took when chasing Puckman. Oh yeah, there was one other thing that they changed too, the name from Puckman to Pac-Man. But why did they do this? <laughs> Seriously? Are you actually asking that? Have you not seen Scott Pilgrim? Yes, well, for that one person out there that doesn't know, it's a proven fact that all American teenagers are nothing but graffiti tagging rascals. Try picturing the street thugs from Batman Forever for the best portray of these hooligans. And because the bosses at Midway were a tad worried that these dreadful kids would change the P for an F, they decided to change Puck to Pack. Now, hold on, hold on guys, do these boomers actually believe that we would have done something like that? Yeah, we definitely would have done that thing. Anyway. When this new reskinned game was officially released as a test cabinet on May the 22nd, 1980 at trade shows, it again got a bit of a lukewarm response. However, after a few final minor revisions involving the game's balance and difficulty, the game finally hit American arcades in July and my god, did they finally get it right. The world became obsessed with Pac-Man, not just in America, but overseas here in Europe too. The game became so popular that the name Pac-Man even became the norm for Japan too. Iwatani-san's dream of creating a game that would appeal to not only lads who dominated the arcades, but also ladies, parents, grandparents, children and couples, of course, had become a reality. As good as Galaxian was, it was another shooter in a room full of shooters and Pac-Man wasn't a shooter and it wasn't a paddle and ball game either. In the beginning, Pac-Man had absolutely no competition. It became a huge hit with over 100,000 machines sold within the first year alone and by the end of that year, Pac-Man had become a household name. But why? What do you actually need to do in Pac-Man? Well, you're Pac-Man, obviously, and you need to whack a whack your way through 240 little white dots on a maze-like screen whilst trying to avoid the four ghosts. you got Blinky, who will usually take the shortest route towards you, Pinky, who will take a roundabout path to surprise you, Inky with his unpredictable movements, who may come out of nowhere to surprise you, and Clyde, who just does what he wants. If you get hit by this undead creature, then you seriously need more practice. 
Thankfully, in the corner of each stage are four power pellets, which are essentially just slightly bigger white dots, which makes the hunter become the hunted, as Mr. Burns would say. The adversarial TV cartoon Tom and Jerry helped shape the relationship between Pac-Man and the ghosts. Had the programming been such that the four ghosts constantly attacked Pac-Man's present location according to the same algorithm, the ghosts would look like a string of beads. Where's the thrill in that? So I introduced AI-type algorithms that had the ghosts coming at Pac-Man from all directions. You simply go for as long as you can until all the dots are gone before doing it all again and again and again. Most players will only get to screen 2, possibly screen 3, but the hardcore Pac-Man players of the world, and I'm talking the highest of the high Pac-Man players, will get to see level 256, where the game will glitch out on what is known as a kill screen by us nerds, and the game is over. Yes, you can, in a way, complete Pac-Man, although it's unlikely that you will ever do it or even meet someone that will ever, ever do it. I've never done it. Obviously, as soon as Pac-Man was released in the arcades, the world went crazy for Pac-Man, or as the popular song goes, we all had Pac-Man fever. An absurd amount of toys, clothes, and pretty much anything that could slap a yellow circle onto, indeed, had a little yellow circle put onto it. And as the popularity grew and grew, a stupid amount of maze games started hitting the arcade in order to catch hold of the success that was Pac-Man. As well as plenty of ports making their way to consoles, most notably the Atari 2600 port. Atari were so sure of the game's success that they actually ended up ordering more cartridges than Atari 2600 consoles were on the market. If ever there was going to be a system seller, then this was going to be it. Todd Fry was the guy put in charge of the game's release, with obviously a very limited time to do so, and not so obviously, very little help. He was, of course, a brilliant designer, but a designer that did things his own way. This led him to dropping out of school and getting kicked out of his family home, living on the streets before becoming a construction worker and then somehow, through a friend, managed to get an interview at Atari to continue on with his coding, which was one of the few things he liked doing back in the day. He of course got the job and was without a doubt one of the oddball characters of the company, barking in hallways and climbing narrow corridor walls, until he accidentally one day cut his head open on a sprinkler requiring stitches. Yeah, a bit of a loose cannon. This then resulted in him getting a bit of a buck your ideas up or you're out talking to from the boss men, and that's exactly what he did, taking on the projects that all others turned down. He was going to port Pac-Man, and he did that very thing by working 80 hours a week for six whole months. And he did this on a machine that was primarily designed to play Pong clones and Tank clones. The game that nobody else would touch, he actually did it. Yep, he did it, or an abridged adaption as he puts it. And as Pac-Man fever was indeed still rampant across the United States when this game was released, it obviously became the best-selling game for the Atari 2600, selling no less than 7.7 .7 million cartridges and earning the gaming giants $200 million in the process. But the company knew that this would be the case. Pac-Man was obviously going to be a big hit, and that's why on the 3rd of April 1982, the day of the game's official release, Atari held 25 events in different cities across America and called it Pac-Man Day. Not only was this one of the first games to ever get a proper release date, even though some retailers had already started selling it weeks before, with the earliest known date being March the 16th, 1982, it was, of course, also by far the most the company had ever spent on promoting a singular video game to date. The response was unreal. This is a real craze. We sold them for $34.88, but I think we could have sold them for $64.88. Unbelievable. We wanted to keep a demonstrator, but someone insisted so violently, we even had to let the sample go. We had a bunch of people ready to break down the doors Tuesday morning. 
this is great and all, and for the time, people were ecstatic that they got to play Pac-Man on the Atari 2600, easily the most popular games console for the time. There was just one problem though. Pac-Man for the Atari 2600 was a pretty dreadful port, compared to the original arcade unit, of course. And the thing is, Atari knew this, which was why when the game was actually advertised on TV, they didn't show any gameplay footage whatsoever. First the Pac-Man eats through a maze of dots, then the Pac-Man heads for the corner spot, then he eats his fill of a power pill. And then all those ghosts turn blue, boo, and Pac-Man eats them all too. Have you played Pac-Man? It's the new video computer game everyone's talking about. And naturally, it's from Atari. Have you played Atari today? Pac-Man for the Atari 2600 was a turning point for all gaming media. And this fact doesn't get brought up enough. The popular for the time Electronic Games magazine had just released its fourth issue on the 11th of June 1982. And Pac-Man, or at least the 2600 version of Pac-Man, was reviewed in this very magazine. Alright folks, first the bad news about the most eagerly waited video game of all time. Atari's VCS version of Pac-Man neither looks nor sounds anything like the coin-op original. The graphics are clunky and unsophisticated. There are no changing bonus items such as cherries, limes, keys, but simply an orange square with a blue dot inside. And the sounds, except for an inappropriate metallic boing whenever the gobbler consumes a pill, are virtually non-existent. Joystick response on all game variations, but especially game one, is horrible. Getting the gobbler to drop down through an opening is an ordeal. The goblins blink constantly, making them difficult to see, and their eyes do not look in the direction they are seeing or traveling, but simply rotate through four positions. Now, what about the good news? Well, there's finally a gobble game available for Atari VCS. Beyond that, it's disappointingly difficult to find anything positive to say about this game. Nowadays, this may not be that big of a deal, but let me tell you, it was. Before this, the magazine and similar magazines had only ever really posted positive reviews for the games that they were covering. Looking back, these things were more information catalogues created by fanboys that couldn't get over the fact that they get to play the latest games and detailing what was going on in the worlds of arcades, handhelds, LCD games and of course Atari home consoles too before everybody else. And it is also worth pointing out that these early magazines really do give an insight into how obsessed the world was with Pac-Man, as you couldn't really go two or three pages without him being talked about or drawn or advertised in some capacity. It was obviously a selling point for these magazines, and because of this, well, everybody knew Pac-Man like the back of their hand. They couldn't get away from it even if they tried. And Pac-Man for the Atari 2600, as okay as it was, was sadly created at a time when Atari's best coders had already moved on or were about to move on. No disrespect to Todd Fry, but this was so obviously not what real Pac-Man gamers wanted. And ever since, gaming media has given a bit more of a critical eye when reviewing games. And Todd himself, who, let's be honest here guys, actually created something that nobody else wanted to touch or possibly could even create, ended up creating the Sword Quest games, which reviewed incredibly highly. Also, let's not forget that he did earn himself a nice 10 cents per Pac-Man game sold, which very much made the once homeless chap a millionaire overnight, a true zero to hero story if I ever do say so myself. Now, according to quite a few people, this was actually the start of the downward spiral that was the video game crash of 1983, one year later. And obviously, of course, there was a lot more to it than that. Pac-Man for the 2600 definitely did play its part. 
And whilst Todd splashed away his 1.3 million in only a couple of years buying no less than 15 vintage guitars, two Alfa Romeos, one of which actually had a Pac-Man license plate, a ranch in Mexico, loads of new suits and of course a whole heap of illegal substances to consume, the rest of the world was still not done with ports of the classic game. Of course, in more recent years, the homebrew community actually managed to make a good as can be version of Pac-Man on the 2600, but at the time, you had the Intellivision, VIC-20, C64, Apple II, IBM PC, TI-99, ZX Spectrum, the Atari 5200, and way, way more than I could possibly ever name, because if I did try and list them all off, it would instantly become an outdated list. Heck, I own two different officially released Pac-Man ports on the Switch alone. By this point, you can get as near perfect as you can possibly ever want for the original Pac-Man game on practically any system you could ever want to. But of course, the original arcade machine is still the best way to go and the incredible quarter arcades come in a very close second. Right, I think we've talked about this game quite enough now, haven't we? The original Pac-Man? Yes. I think it's now time that we talk about its sequel, and to do that very thing, we need to go back a little bit from when all these ports were released, back to 1981, with the release of Ms. Pac-Man. The story of one of the earliest arcade sequel success stories actually starts at MIT. Doug McRae was in charge of looking after a pinball machine in the dormitory of MIT and eventually with his partner Kevin Curran, they jumped into the arcade crazed and purchased themselves 20 separate machines for those dorms. One of the more popular arcade titles at their disposal was Missile Command, however, those MIT gamers would soon work out how to play the game at an expert level and because of this, less quarters were of course deposited as the play sessions extended with every quarter inserted. In an attempt to combat this, the duo got to work on an add-on for the unit which would change certain algorithms on the original arcade board to make it harder and would you believe it, it was a massive success. This led the duo down the path of selling these little circuit board add-ons via newspaper ads and very quickly a business was born named GCC, aka General Computer Corporation. And the two quickly dropped out of MIT themselves because of this and hired more dropouts to help them on their rather odd journey. Super Missile Command was the name of their unofficial add-on, and as the popularity grew for this add-on, including overseas, the next logical step was to take on whatever the next big thing was. We started working on Asteroids and Pac-Man. Work on the Asteroids kit didn't get far. For an enhancement kit to be successful, you need a large install base, so only the most popular arcade games are good targets. Asteroids was the biggest build of any game in the USA, 77,000 cabinets, but by mid-1981, it looked like Pac-Man was going to beat that by a wide margin. The plan was to get the Pac-Man conversion kit out by Christmas that same year, when they expected that the world would have grown bored of the Pac-Man game, as hardcore players could quite quickly understand the logical paths of the ghost and eventually master the game. You see, as soon as you know how to take on each of the four mazes, you could pretty much play for as long as you want. The thrill of progressing really did drop after this point for hardcore gamers. And this team wanted to keep the challenge alive so that their professional players could attempt to master a far more difficult version of the game, which of course would keep arcade owners very, very happy. They did this by adding more corners and fewer exits. In later stages, the patterns of the ghosts were changed and even the fruit moved about. Now, these may seem like pretty simple changes, and they were, but they changed the gameplay significantly. By simply adding a random number generator to the ghost's typical patterns greatly improved the chances of them finding you. This eliminated the ability to take the same pattern over and over, as well as the ability to hide. Seriously, next time you're playing Pac-Man, put yourself into the bottom right-hand corner of the T-junction below the ghost generator, and you can hide there for literally days. The ghosts will never, ever find you. But 
but that simply does not happen with this add-on. Changing it from being a game of pattern memorization and turning it into pure skill. This is why hardcore pack fans prefer the game over the original for the most part and why it was so widely accepted as one of the best sequels ever made. However, you know, let's not get ahead of ourselves here guys, because before it was Ms. Pac-Man, it was actually a completely different game. Crazy Otto was that game, and the reason for its rather ugly change-up was because of a lawsuit with Atari over that Super Missile Command add-on. Now, Atari obviously wasn't a fan of these guys making money off of their cabinets, and GCC didn't really see an issue as it wasn't rewriting, it wasn't pirating, or changing up their original code, but instead, they were adding to it. And whilst all of these lawsuits were going on, this Pac-Man add-on was also being worked on at the same time. However, this time, they decided to, you know, play it safe by changing up the sprites as well, which, by the way, were actually designed by using Hasbro's Little Bright toy. <laughs> I love that little factoid. <laughs> you can make lots of pretty pictures with Light Bright from Hasbro. Anyway, these legal battles dragged on, and with Atari not exactly looking all that great in the media fighting these young lads who seriously didn't want to give up the battle, they made the decision to reach out to the XMIT students, stop the lawsuit, and instead hire them to make games for them. This was obviously nothing but a win-win for everybody involved, and GCC used it as a way to actively sell the Pac-Man product directly to Midway, who were responsible for distributing the Pac-Man arcade original units in the States. You see, Midway and Atari were in and out of court like no one's business back then. Heck, the most popular video game ever released on the Magnavox Odyssey 2 was a game called Casey Munchkin. When you're hungry for real excitement, munch. When you're hungry for fast action, munch. With Odyssey's new PC Munchkin video game, it's eat or be eaten as you chase through mind-boggling mazes, gobbling up points. And when you're hungry to step up the challenge, munch. Odyssey's computer keyboard lets you program a myriad of mazes all your own. Nobody else's maze game does that. KC Munchkin, available now. Programmed by you. A game where you run around a rotating maze as a blue munchkin munching munchies and avoiding the munchers. It wasn't Pac-Man. Except, of course, it was, and it even beat Atari to the home console race by an entire year. This sort of thing was just not uncommon and was a real headache for Midway. Which is why Dave Morofsky, the president of Midway, took GCC's friendly threat as a good thing. Hey, Atari backed down from fighting against us with Missile Command, so I'd be careful if I was you. This Pac-Man booster pack, which by the way, has actually proved to be more popular than your original Pac-Man game in testing centers, is not only finished, but ready to be distributed. <laughs> okay, okay, yes, that was a little bit exaggerated, but still, the end result for GCC was definitely achieved. Midway ended up inviting them to their offices for a meeting instead of inviting them to court, and as you probably predicted, that meeting went very very well. In the words of Hot Chocolate, everyone's a winner, baby. That's the truth, because Midway took this as the perfect way to steer clear of the biggest competition in the arcade space that they definitely would have had, and in turn made a decent chunk of change in the process putting GCC in charge of the first proper sequel to Pac-Man. This was of course after the sprite work was changed from Crazy Otto to Super Pac-Man and then again changed to Pac-Woman after Midway suggested that the female character that you saw in the Crazy Otto animated sequences between levels should be the new main character. And with GCC now being paid by Midway, obviously agreed. So they gave her red hair, blue eyes and a bow. This proved to be a problem, due to the fact that when the character ran away, or should I say up the screen, the brown hair became a large part of the sprite and she looked very similar to one of the ghosts herself. Nakamura-san was the first to notice this issue when the prototype was shown to him in Japan. Love the concept, get rid of the hair. Which they did, and when she got yet another name change and design into Mrs. Pac-Man, and that name, well it didn't exactly roll off the tongue either, 
Miss Pac-Man didn't work as the third and final cutscene showed her and Pac-Man having a baby brought in by a stork, so you know, having a baby out of wedlock, and that wasn't going to fly for Namco. So of course, Miss Pac-Man was finally agreed upon and boom, the arcades just got themselves another surefire hit. Hey Joey, what's she really like? She's the most exciting woman I ever met. Atari introduces the woman of the year, Ms. Pac-Man. Just like the arcade classic, four different game screens, floating fruit, even pretzels. Honey, don't you know, I'm more than Pac-Man with a bow. Reach for Ms. Pac-Man. Reach, reach, reach for Atari. And when I say surefire hits, I mean it. Ms. Pac-Man almost became as big as the original Pac-Man character himself, and there's no point in stopping there, right? Nope, because only one year after that original, we got this, Ms. Pac-Man, and one year after this, we got... Well, we actually got quite a lot. But let's start off with Baby Pac-Man. Now, Baby Pac-Man is not the little squirt that came in from the stalk during that third cutscene of Ms. Pac-Man. That was actually Junior Pac-Man, and we will get to him later. Baby Pac-Man, whose artwork first appeared in The Pinball Machine by Bally the same year, titled Mr. and Mrs. Pac-Man, which by the way was actually pretty incredible, requiring you to collect move points and then use those move points to play a light-up game of Pac-Man in the center of the table, was the third entry in the Pac-Man family of games. Baby Pac-Man wasn't only going to continue on the typical arcade formula set by the games before it, but also Bally's midway pinball side of the business too. The final game ended up being a hybrid of both genres where you use a joystick to play a fairly typical game on the top screen and a not so typical pinball game down below on a small but beautiful pinball table. Of course, the rules have been changed up a fair bit here as you need to earn power pellets in the pinball portion of the game to show up in the video game portion of the game. You do this by hitting the yellow bumpers at the top of the play field that each light up a row of letters that spell out Pac-Man. And on the left hand side, you have a loop that every time you pass you spell out the word fruit which upgrades the fruit and in turn gives you more points and on the right you do the same thing spelling out tunnel which in turn gives you extra ways to maneuver away from the bad guys when playing on the video game portion of the unit. Sadly, it's not a game I've ever had the ability to actually play myself as much as I would love to do that thing. It's incredibly prone to breaking down and it's incredibly rare. If you guys ever see this, you should definitely give it a go. The next year, Bally Midway put out yet another Pac-Man game featuring another character from the world of Pac-Man, this time called Professor Pac-Man. This game was trying to jump onto the rather niche quiz arcade market that had seen a small rise in the early 80s where Professor Pac-Man would simply ask you a set of visual based puzzles and you in turn would have a short amount of time to answer them. The game, unsurprisingly, wasn't very popular with only 400 units being made and 300 of which supposedly being returned, which we will get to in a bit. It was a Pac-Man game by its name alone, but it absolutely featured nothing that arcade goers wanted. And then you had Junior Pac-Man. Yes, Junior Pac-Man, that Pac-Man that featured in the Ms. Pac-Man cutscenes. What's different about this one? Well, it was done by GCC, which means, again, not a lot of big changes were made, but instead a good amount of smaller ones. The main and most obvious change up was that the maze was bigger. The way they achieved this was by scrolling the screen left and right, which uncovered more of the playfield. and as GCC were still using what was available to them in the original game's code, they found fatter dots, which when eaten would actually slow down Junior, but at the same time would give him more points. These show up when your movable bonus items fly over those dots, but you still need to munch. However, if these bonus items hit your power pellets, then they will explode. Add all of this with the unpredictable nature of the ghost from Ms. Pac-Man and you actually have a game that is stupidly hard to beat but still pretty fun to actually try and accomplish. But it's likely that you never will. It's a very hard game. 
You see, what you got to remember is that even though the average player will only see the second or possibly the third maze on Pac-Man, these GCC guys made the original Ms. Pac-Man as a response to all of those people out there that mastered the game, and this junior Pac-Man was essentially going further down that path. Pac-Man Jr. was even harder than the game that came before it, and because of that, even though the most hardcore of hardcore Pac-Man gamers may like it, the majority of gamers didn't exactly fall for this game, making it the final entry in the series made by GCC. And with that, Bally Midway had not only helped distribute Pac-Man onto western shores, they also brought in a whole heap of other characters, including a wife, two kids, a professor, a spin-off pinball machine, and even their own enhancement kit, not to be confused with what GCC were doing originally. Pac-Man Plus. It was different, but not really any different than the original. The exciting new Pac-Man Plus, as the arcade flyer boasted, changed some of the colours around, the fruit around, the ghost sprites around, and even included a can of Coca-Cola, because, you know, why not? A few minor gameplay changes got included too, but they are so minor, you're not going to notice them. This brought the grand total to seven. Seven arcade games in just a few years. Now, granted, one of those games was obviously the original Pac-Man, but did you know that wasn't all that they wanted to do with the yellow dot? Pac-Man 2 was a handheld game put forward but created by Entex and a cancelled arcade machine. The original LCD title was put out by Tomy. Count Pacula was another Finnish pinball video game hybrid that never got off the ground. There are rumours of a Sega collaboration arcade game that brought the worlds of Pac-Man and Pengo together, although this may have just been a bootleg. It's also not clear whether Ms. Pac-Man Plus was official or not. Of course, you had the absurd amount of merchandise, including the hit single, board games, a decent amount of mini LED systems, and even a short-lived Six Flags Entertainment Playground inclusion, where you could meet Pac-Man and Ms. Pac-Man, who definitely didn't look scary with their flappy mouths. And then you had the Hanna-Barbera animated Saturday morning TV show that also featured a whole heap of its own merchandise. Mostly in Italy for some reason, although I have no idea why, over there that show completely blew up. And that show was actually so heavily sponsored that during its initial run, the commercial break was double the length of normal commercial breaks in order to fit them all in. And seriously guys, who can blame them? This was just the tip of the iceberg. All of this came out within only three years. Pac-Mania does not even begin to explain how crazy the world was for Pac-Man during this time. And if you think Namco themselves were happy with this back in Japan, well, you would actually be mistaken. In the eyes of Namco, Bally Midway had done what they were tasked to do, but at the same time, they had gone way, way, way overboard. I mean, they wasn't wrong in doing what they did, they was allowed to do this, and it was obviously done because Namco themselves were simply taking too long in Midway's eyes at getting sequels out the door. But still, it was just way, way too much for Namco, and because of this, they ended up cutting ties with Bally Midway from here on out. But yet again, guys, we are in fact getting a little ahead of ourselves, because during all of this, if we go back to 1980 to 1983, or 1984 actually, even Namco were putting out Pac-Man games too. Not at the level Midway were doing, oh no, no, no. But with that said, None of what Namco produced themselves ever came close to Ms. Pac-Man, and well, for Namco, that's gotta hurt. Check the mic and make sure it sound right, boys. First up was Super Pac-Man in 1982. The idea in this game was that instead of eating dots, you eat food, which is behind certain gated areas for the most part. In order to do this, you need to collect keys to open doors or become Super Pac-Man, which will let you smash straight through them. You can also temporarily speed up Pac-Man to an almost uncontrollable speed by smacking the super speed button, which actually was reduced down a little bit by Bally when it was brought over to Western Shores. The maze is pretty basic by comparison to everything that we have seen before. However, because of this key mechanic, you will find yourself dying all over the screen to get to whatever random gates they may open. And of course, you gotta do all of this whilst dodging the ghosts or attacking them after consuming a power pellet. It sound right, boy. 
In more recent years, it has gained a bit of a cult following, but at the time, the Namco-created sequel didn't exactly pull in the numbers that Valley Midway's Ms. Pac-Man did, which it essentially was in competition with, and because of that, it got practically no love in regards to its home console ports. The second game, and fifth overall by Namco, was Pac and Pal, very much a follow-up to their previous Super Pac-Man. The big difference was that in this game, you have to run over upside-down playing cards that will then flip over and open the locked areas instead of keys. Also new to this release is Miru, Pac-Man's pal, who just so happens to be a ghost that has befriended Pac-Man and helps him along his way collecting fruit. The only problem was, the more the ghost collected, the less you collected, and therefore hardcore players will actually want to race to these items before the ghost has a chance to help out. An attempt was made to bring the cabinet to western shores, with the only difference being Miru being changed for Pac-Man's dog from the Hanna-Barbera cartoon show called Chomp Chomp, but after it was sent out to several arcades, it received underwhelming profits and was quickly cancelled. Which finally brings us to easily the most interesting spin-off for the franchise besides Professor Pac-Man, and that was of course Pac-Lands, the final game that was published by Bally Midway and produced by Namco themselves. Now, as stated, Namco wasn't exactly too happy with how much juice had been squeezed out of the little yellow dot by Bally Midway. And because of this, moving forward, a lot of those characters that Bally Midway brought to the arcades were completely forgotten about. But with that said, there's no denying that some of those characters were a seriously big deal. They knew better than to take Ms. Pac-Man away. After all, the original intent was to get more females into arcades, and even though the original game did that very thing, Ms. Pac-Man did it even more, becoming the Betty Boop of video game mascots and even rivaling the big man himself. On top of that, not only were some of these games outselling what even Namco could do, the TV show also proved to be extremely popular. And that's why a video game very heavily focused on the show was created by Namco themselves. I suppose it's a case of choose your battles, right? Now, Namco did obviously take some creative control with the original design, making the characters look like a mix between what they originally designed in the artwork for their games and what the Saturday morning TV show provided. In this platforming game, you have three buttons, left, right, and jump. Your aim, in the original Japanese release at least, is to transport a fairy who is under your hat all the way home whilst dodging a crazy amount of ghosts and jumping over them or collecting power pellets and eating them. But on top of all of this, the other big difference was that this game kind of plays a little bit like a track and field game too. You see, the more you tap the directional button in the arcades, the faster Pac-Man will run in that direction, until he is pretty much uncontrollable. Not something that newcomers will want to do, but speedrunners would seriously get a kick out of. Making the smallest and simplest jumps very hard to predict, and making the larger gaps a leap of faith that you're very likely going to miss on your first go, Still, if you do reteach yourself to play this type of platformer, you may actually find that you enjoy it. It's obvious as to why it didn't do all of that well back in 1984, even with Bally Midway's attempts to slightly slow it down and of course make it even more like the Saturday morning cartoon show. But still, it is a solid, albeit incredibly strange entry that retro gaming nuts find quite inspirational. Oh, and by the way, even Shigeru Miyamoto was inspired by this game's design and overall look as he took the blue sky look of this game and put it into Super Mario Brothers. 
So there you have it. The end of the Bally Midway years. Obviously, the hype that was Pac-Man Mania resulted in even more ports of Pac-Land getting pushed onto as many systems as possible, and even the setting of Pac-Land was used in the more recently released Smash Bros. games from the Wii U onwards. So what came next? Well, Pac-Man actually ended up going on a three-year break between proper Pac-Man releases. And as Pac-Man Mania started to dwindle down a little bit, Namco decided to go back to their roots for the final Pac-Man arcade game that they were going to release. Spoiler alert, it actually wasn't the final Pac-Man arcade game release, but you knew that already. Pac-Mania is essentially Pac-Man, but now with a slightly isometric view. At its core, it's Pac-Man, but with a whole heap of 16-bit makeup slapped on top, which most definitely isn't a bad thing. The other big difference is, of course, the fact that you can jump. This makes play sessions last a little bit longer, giving you the ability to jump over pretty much all of the ghosts at once if they're clubbed together enough. But as the AI has indeed improved since the original, it can be quite the challenge in later levels to nail that down. I am personally a big fan of this change-up, and even though I obviously prefer the originals, this is still an excellent follow-up that does just enough to make it a worthy sequel without alienating fans of the original. Plus, I think it was the first ever Pac-Man game that I ever played on the Amstrad CPC. As you may have expected, a crazy amount of ports were made for this game, including endless amounts of Pac-Man collection sets, which again, is nothing but a good thing, and if you ask me, even though the series has definitely had a few low points, this game was the perfect way to round off Pac-Man Mania. By this point, the heydays were over. Of course, it wasn't the last we would see of the little yellow ball, but I think it's fair to say that he has hit his peak here. What Namco was able to produce, and of course, Bally Midway were able to promote, was something truly special. It was a game that even to this day is pretty unbeatable when it comes to recognition. This final game signals the end of an era. Sure, it was technically a 16-bit game. However, what came next was a new path for Pac-Man. We had obviously seen plenty of arcade ports already for home consoles, but now it was time to take Pac-Man down a very different path, attempting to take on the booming console market of the 90s and make sure the world never forgets Namco's flagship mascot, Pac-Man. Hey there guys, thank you for checking out Pac-Man The Complete History Part 1. Yes, Part 2 is right around the corner, give me a couple of weeks, I'll have that done. And obviously Patrons and YouTube members will be able to see that slightly early. So if you want to become one of those people to get to see this exclusive content early, then you know what to do. Check the links down below and become a Patreon or YouTube member. A massive thank you goes out to all of the collaborators in this video. We had G, uh, GTV, we had Ashins. Lazy Game Reviews, uh, Wrestling With Gaming, Top Hat Gaming Man, uh, I'm definitely forgetting some, Ant Dude, Weird Video Games, great to have you back buddy, and I'm pretty sure that's it, I'm pretty sure that's it, there'll be a name above if I've forgotten anybody, uh, RMC as well, yes, um, yeah, I had a lot of collaborators with this, and this was a long time project, so I really appreciate you guys sticking around and watching it. If you've got this far, give me a high five in the comments. Anyway, as a part of the video, I'd like to give a massive shout out to all of the Patreons and YouTube members that support the show every single month with a special shout out going to Michael Ridley, Dash, uh, Cobar474, De Action Saxon, Christopher DeVero, Roll Van uh, Proegen, <laughs> Control Alt Reese, J is Manchild, Caesar D. Uh, Souser, Dominic Devonport, Daniel Terrares, Clan Bob, Nicholas Burtner, Taylor Rainwater, J, uh, Jabba Al Aden, Jacob P, aka Avalon James, Benjamin Guy, Andrew Ward, Sashi Dog Hut, Man Shovel, Brandon Gold, Chris the Shapeshift, 
Lifter, Aaron Gorman, Big Rico, RetroReversing.com, Richard Aldridge, Shadow Dragon, Ryan Holtz, Wobbles and Bean, The Wonder Ducks, Game Apologist, Dina, Jonathan Hayward, Intrigued Gaming, Ye Old Hamburglar, uh, Solix Captor, Rovan Army, Jeremy Rodriguez, Tim Lunn, Nick Pollard, Bram Perez, Gary Pinkett, Pretendo64, Richard Carter, aka Fantastic Dizzy, Conrad Constantine, Andrew Dalton, Retro to Next Gen, aka Lou, King Link Reviews, Todd Paul Flo G, Tim Labonte, Lipped, Steve Krug Drums, Arista, y Yahir L Lopez, Dina81, Harvey 2478, Nightwill, Shade Silence, Mind of the Unsane, Trans Rights, hmm, Michael Towns, Cremilla, Stephen, Cheshire One, Vike Echo, The Shaded J, Rocket Plot, The Cunning Linguist, Man of God 9000, That Gamer, and Samuel Nilsson. I just remembered as I started going down that list that also Nostalgia Nerd was a pretty big part of the video as well, <laughs> being the voice of Toro Iwatani. Sorry, mate. Go and check out all of those channels down below. A massive shout out goes out to King Monkey as well, who provided some of the footage in this particular video. Um, thank you to That Gamer Dad for helping uh, just check a few of the facts on this as well. And uh, finally, there was one more as well. Uh, uh, Timo, uh, thank you very much for providing some of the footage as well, mate. <laughs> yes, Akatimo64, yeah. So there you go, guys. Massive, so, so, so proud that I've got to get this video done. And uh, like I say, part two will be coming up very shortly. Thank you for supporting the show, however you decide to do that very thing. And until next time, guys, this is DJ Slope signing out and hopefully, I'll see you all next time. Bye-bye.